Welcome, everybody. Good to have you all here today. My name is Anna Diaz, and I'm a lead advisor with Dallin and Yonke Wealth Advisors. And today I'll be moderating today's conversation with Dr. Erica Sapphire. On behalf of all of my colleagues at DNY, we're thrilled that you're here to participate in today's conversation, which should be very interesting and obviously very timely. As a local San Diegan, I'm extremely proud of the intellectual capital that lives in our city. It's organizations like the La Jolla Institute and the research and the critical work they're doing at this very important time in our human history, as you all know. So before I give you a little bit of background on Dr. Sapphire, a little bit about our firm. So DNY was founded in 1991, which means this year is our 30th year anniversary. Dallin and Yonke was a pioneer in the wealth management industry, choosing since its founding to be a fiduciary, which means putting its clients' interests first and choosing to be independent. Today, we manage over $5 billion in assets for clients, providing portfolio management and financial planning services to over 1,300 clients in San Diego and across the country. We deeply care about the financial lives of our clients and their well being and remain humbled by the trust you have placed in us at this very important time. So let's give you a little bit of background on Dr. Sapphire. So Dr. Sapphire is a professor at, professor at the La Jolla Institute of Infectious Disease and Vaccine Research. She was asked by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to lead a global coronavirus immunotherapy consortium to quickly identify antibodies to combat the coronavirus. She also led consor a consortium that united academic, government, and industrial labs across five different continents to understand antibody therapeutics against various viruses like Ebola, Marburg, Lassa, and others. Most recently, and very excitingly, she was awarded the Scientist of the Year by ARCS for her work around the coronavirus. So for our guests, thank you to many of you because many of you submitted questions before today's presentation and it was very helpful. Dr. Sapphire has kindly curated her comments today around a lot of those questions. We would do encourage you during today's talk to keep those questions coming. So you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. Please feel free to send those questions as they surface for you and our team behind the scenes will be aggregating those. And then I will lead a Q&A session with Dr. Erica Sapphire after her talk. So before I introduce, uh, we have Dr. Sapphire begin her conversation, I do want to introduce Christopher Lee. He is the Chief Advancement Officer for the La Jolla Institute. He'll give some background on the organization, and then he'll pass it over to Dr. Sapphire. Thanks to all of you for being here. Chris, I'll, I'll send it over to you. Thank you, Anna. And uh, thank you all for giving us the chance to uh, introduce the Institute and Erica and on a, such an important topic during such an important time. Uh, congratulations to Dowling and Yonke for the 30 year anniversary. We also are an organization that's about uh, 30 years old in San Diego and like uh, DNY, a real gem. Um, so if everyone, what I normally would do if I was presenting you this in person, I would ask who has heard of the Institute and to be honest with you, in the past, we wouldn't have had a lot of uh, hands raised, but given our um, uh, great work in, in this last year and Erica's great work over the last, uh, you know, her career, the Institute is getting larger exposure for being the uh, elite and uh, uh, organization that it is and one that all San Diegans can be proud of. So I'll give you a, just a couple quick minute overview of who we are uh, in short, once the world gets back to normal, we'd love to have anybody who is interested out to uh, come see the lab in person, come meet Erica in person and uh, meet a lot of our scientists and administrative, administrative team that would show you that uh, we are all deeply appreciative of the community support that we receive. And we are a very open and welcome place to share our great work. So that being said, I'd like to show you just a few slides um, Am I able to open this up, um, Caitlin? Are you all able to see my screen? No, no I'm afraid we're not. Let me see, start. Better?
Not yet. No. Uh, That's it. Okay. So thank you all. Sorry for the, for the hiccup. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, the Institute is uh, one of the world leading organizations. It's a, it's a nonprofit medical research organization focused entirely on studying the immune system. Uh, these numbers, uh, given the uh, uh, historic success we've had over the last couple of years, are uh, small pillars of where we, we were and we're already uh, greatly surpassed a uh, number of things such as dollars that the Institute uh, has each year to spend on research, uh, number of employees, we have about 500 employees, uh, 21 principal investigators, which are our faculty, which Erica is uh, one of our gems, and if not the gem of the Institute. But uh, as I mentioned, we're right down the street from all of you and right in the um, research corridor that many of you are familiar with, uh, and we are affiliated with UCSD. So again, please come see us for yourself. Uh, why we are as good as we are is we have a clear and powerful focus. We spend our, our days entirely focusing on understanding the immune system and the behavior of the immune system. And why do we do that? Uh, for our mission to create a life without disease. We believe understanding and investigating the immune system could uh, help us uh, understand and prevent and cure any number of diseases that affect so many of us. We are structured in three centers, and I know Erica will talk about this a little bit more detail, but our three centers of focus are um, cancer, and we have a cancer immunotherapy trial uh, based on the work from one of our researchers underway in the clinic. For example, uh, we have an autoimmunity and inflammation center, which focuses on, as you can imagine, uh, the, the large number of autoimmune conditions and things such as uh, heart disease. And lastly, and what, again, we're gonna spend time talking about today and has brought us great uh, attention around the whole world is our infectious disease and vaccine development center, which Erica is a real leader in. Uh, our 21 faculty, and you'll see names and, and, or excuse me, see faces you might recognize there in your community, including our president and C chief scientific officer, Mitch Cronenberg, and, the, and our star of the show coming soon, Erica, are organized uh, in, in each of these centers to do their work to basically under, understand the underlying uh, behavior of the immune system, but also as a way to combine their efforts and combine their brilliance to see how those behaviors might affect diseases both in the center they're assigned and as well as uh, provide clues to others working on different parts of the continuum. Uh, back early last year when the coronavirus uh, affected all of us, we formed a task force of some of our top minds to address uh, elements of the uh, understanding of the virus and, and addressing the pandemic, which basically, as Erica will go into detail on, didn't mean that we got to uh, put on hold other work, but instead just add extra work to already a very successful group of people. And they've all worked tirelessly over the last year to come forward with incredible developments that have really informed the current vaccines that are out there, as well as all kinds of other therapies and all kinds of other clues about the virus that have been helpful to getting us to the more positive position we're in today. Uh, one example of that and the importance of our work and maybe how we all feel, uh, why didn't I know of the Institute before? Well, the good news is lots of the people who are making decisions of this uh, in this country do know who the Institute is, including Tony Fauci, you know, obviously a hero to many uh, this last year for all that he's done to, to steer us uh, through this pandemic. Uh, when mentioned, when brought to Congress to talk about what's underway to help us and help citizens of this country, uh, Tony Fauci specifically referenced work underway at the La Jolla Institute as the kind of work that's making a difference that we need more of to help us address the pandemic. So Congress at the time might not have known about us, but they certainly have since too. So with that being said, I obviously uh, can't go on enough about the great work Erica does, the, the kind of great uh, collaborations she's built around the Mesa here in San Diego and around the world. And as mentioned earlier, she was recently named, and I know ARCS is a, uh, a group that's fond to all of us on the call, uh, as the ARCS Scientist of the Year as just the latest uh, addition to her many accolades. So with that being said, Erica, 
I'd like to turn it to you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Anna. It's such a pleasure to speak with you today. I will, uh, Chris, I'll need you to stop sharing your slides so that I can start mine. Yes, I'm sorry here. And thank you to all the Dowling and Yankee clients for your questions. Um, it's certainly what's on all of our minds. And I'll show you some of what the research we are doing and the new findings and uh, what we know about the mutations that are emerging. So this is where we work. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about our cons international consortium for antibody therapeutics, where we are in this pandemic, what the changes are in the virus and what we've learned about immune defense. Now in the questions that you sent me ahead of time, you asked me things like, why is there so much variation in the virus? What are the variants? Where are they in the virus? Should we be worried about them? Will the vaccines protect against these emerging variants and new variants that we have yet to uncover, but are probably out there? And how do we adapt the vaccines toward these future variants? So I'll show you some of my answers in detail, but briefly, they vary because of immune pressure and spillover. The mutations are in the receptor binding site in the more, and the other answers are yes, most likely, and yes. So let me walk you through those. So the first thing is that viruses change when they change hosts or change cells. For a novel outbreak virus, we use a term called spillover. When the virus comes from its natural host or animal reservoir into humans, that's the introduction of an outbreak. We call that a spillover event, spilling over into the human population. There's another term, which is spill back. That's when virus has then gone from humans back into animals, other animals. And so the spillover is what starts the outbreak. When it comes from the natural reservoir, and it might be something that we've never seen before, didn't know that virus existed, and infects humans. So many outbreaks start with mosquitoes biting humans like Zika and dengue, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis virus. They start from mouse to human. So uh, lymphocytic chorio-meningitis virus, which causes birth defects, is spread by house mice. Loss of fever, hemorrhagic fever in, in um, Western Africa and the Chupo virus in South America spread from populations of field mice or house mice to humans. Other viruses like Ebola and Nipah are bat to humans. MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and another coronavirus is camel to human. And the first SARS, SARS-1 from 2003, was spread, they thought, from civet cats to humans. And these spillover events happen when these animals bite humans, when we hunt or when we butcher them for food, or also through animal waste. When we get infected with mouse virus, this is often for mouse urine or mouse droppings that have been aerosolized in our homes and our cabins, or in our food. Um, another source of animal waste, for example, outbreaks of the up to 90% Nipah virus happen when bat waste get into palm sap that is drunk, or when humans enter caves in which bats are in, in dense population and there's full of bat guano, the Marburg virus. The spill back, so the spill over is what starts the outbreak from forest to human. Spill back is what propagates the outbreak. And that's when there's enough virus in humans and humans are shedding enough virus that they spread it to animals. Could be different kinds of animals. So it could go back from human to mosquito. The mosquitoes bite an infected human. It could be human to cat, whether they're domesticated cats for coronavirus or wild cats. It could be human to mink as we've seen this year. And those spill back happens when humans have direct contact with animals. It could be because they're our pets. It could be because we're their keepers. It could be we're our veterinarians. Or when animals come in contact with human materials or trash is full of our viruses. Our wastewater is full of our viruses. So there's spillover and spill back. And the important thing and why this causes pressure and adaption in a virus is that when a virus enters a new host, it's under different sorts of pressures. It has to figure out how to operate in a new cell with different parameters and slightly different receptors and factors. A virus by itself is not a lie. It needs to hijack your cells in order to have the materials and factories it needs to replicate and propagate itself. It must understand, use, and hijack all the materials in your cells to propagate its life cycle. Well, if it's gone from human to mink, well, now all of a sudden it has to figure out how to use the mink receptor instead of the human receptor. And so all the minute little changes that happen as the virus makes lots of little lack of proofreading errors every time it copies itself 
sometimes one of those confers an advantage. If it happens upon a mutation that gives it better ability to anchor to that mink and explodes in greater amplification in the mink and greater transmissibility, well, sometimes that's a worse virus for us too. So when a virus spills in from one species to another, there can be a flurry of mutational selection where it looks for variants and enhances variants. So this fall, North Denmark was in lockdown over a cluster of mutations found in mink farms that were spilled back from humans to mink, and then many more humans got infected back from those mink, and they had to cull thousands and thousands of mink. They also found the virus spilling over into North American mink, both those kept for fur and also those in the wild. That's an evidence of spillback. And other kinds of spillback have been in the news. So transmission of SARS from humans to their pet cats or even the tigers at the Bronx Zoo, recently the gorillas in the San Diego Zoo. Any animals with which we interact, we shed aerosol viruses. And then they spill back again from those animals back to the humans. And what becomes a worry is when the virus propagates in these species, whether they're species that we keep as pets or as livestock or back in the wild, because then it can get reintroduced back to humans as well. And so through analysis of the mink this fall, many, many mutations were found. Not all of them are bad for us. Some of them weaken the virus, that's fine. We don't mind those, but we keep an eye on the ones that enhance transmissibility, enhance receptor binding and evade antibody responses. And what we've been doing in my lab is looking at the molecular level about what these changes are and what they mean for that surface spike protein, the surface protein the virus uses to attach the cells. And the ones we're most concerned about are those that enhance the virus's ability to infect us. Now, very much in the news, there's been another source of mutational selection, and that was what has arise, risen in the human-to-human -human transmission. So we've now had 93 million cases of the coronavirus. When this novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, emerged, all of us were immunologically naive, meaning we had no pre-existing immunity to this virus. We all looked like fresh meat, and it was able to spread essentially unchecked person to person, continent to continent. It was fairly quiet on the mutation level for the first 10 months. One mutation arose, D614G, and I'll talk about in a second, that conferred an advantage to the virus and became globally dominant within a month. But that was about the only one. But then later this fall, after months of cycling, enough period of, of, of time had transpassed and enough humans had been infected that created the opportunities for more mutation to flourish and clusters of mutation to emerge. One of these we've heard comes from the United Kingdom. Some of these were originally identified in Kent. Other ones emerged from South Africa. And it is thought that some of this transmission may have occurred through lack of immune control. And so one episode has been well studied, and this is emergence of a cluster of mutations that look dangerous that emerged essentially in a cancer patient in the United Kingdom. Because that cancer patient had a compromised immune system, the virus established itself in a chronic way. It infected that patient for months instead of two weeks. And over the period of months, and lack of enough immune system control to wipe it out, gave it just enough pressure to try to steer that virus to escape what immune responses there were. And that could have amplified the presence of mutation. There have been suggestions that some of the mutation clusters that emerged from South Africa could correlate with a high pre prevalence there of people infected with HIV-1 and tuberculosis. When these people are immune suppressed, they can't clear the virus. It gives an opportunity for that virus to linger in that human for months. When it's a chronic infection, there's more time for all those little errors that normally happen at a small scale to build up and have an opportunity to select. When we have chronic infection and lack of immune control, we're likely to see a greater number of mutations arising and then spillover of those mutant viruses into other humans. So that brings us to another question that several of you asked me. There has been discussion now on if we are limited in the number of vaccine doses, can we get them to stretch further? Can we give half doses of vaccine? Is that just as good as a whole dose? Or can we give one dose of vaccine instead of the two doses? You know, you need one shot, you need another shot a month later. That's called a prime and a boost. 
do we need to give this boost or can we vaccinate twice as many people? And the arguments are significant at both sides of that equation. We'll find people with just as many degrees arguing on one side and arguing on the other. There are many people who have spent their lives developing vaccines that say that in their experience, in other vaccines we have developed, and we don't know for this one yet, but in other vaccines we have developed, you often get a better immune response if you wait four to six months between the prime and the boost. So right now, what has been currently evaluated for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines is three weeks or four weeks, not four to six months. The reason for the accelerated schedule is that we're in a pandemic. We may not have the luxury of time to wait six months to, in order to develop that immunity. So the question is, with that condensed schedule, the three or four weeks between first and second shots, between prime and boost, do we get the same antibody response as if we'd waited later? And do we even have the luxury of waiting to wait way later? If we have elderly people, if we have healthcare workers that are susceptible to an onslaught of virus that is certainly out there, can we afford to take that chance? The worry is that if, if these people are insufficiently pro in protected, well, then they will develop disease. And if they are insufficiently protected, does that just create the Petri dish that will encourage more mutation? The answer is it's just not really no. We don't have all of the data of what happens if we delay six months or what happens if we give a lower dose instead of a higher dose. In some of the clinical trial data, it has been observed that the lower dose of Moderna might have been just as effective, especially in young people with a robust immune response. And so there are trials in the UK now building upon that very small amount of data to see if that's something that could be used more broadly. Is there a way to stretch the material that can be delivered? There are other studies in progress, particularly at, for people that are very vulnerable, the immune compromised or the elderly, we don't wanna mess with that protection. My personal thought is that, we, that, it, that if the clinical trial data on the over 40,000 people says that we get 95% efficacy with a certain regimen of two shots a month apart, we need to protect these vulnerable people from what is likely severe disease. We don't wanna mess with this formula. But for otherwise young and healthy healthcare workers who might wanna participate in a research study at an academic medical center, they could actually collect that data to say what happens if we delay, what happens if we give half a dose instead of a full dose. And there are some medical centers that are now doing those trials so we get that data. The mutations that have emerged are these. There's one thing called the UK variant. It has another name, a more scientific name, B.1.1.7. And it first emerged, we think in September, the first human sequences that contain this cluster of variations were found at the end of September in the United Kingdom. And the countries in which that virus was rapidly transported between September and December are the ones that are shown in dark gray or navy blue here. By December, earlier January, it had spread to other continents. So in a very short period of time, before science really realized that these mutations were present in the cluster and spreading, it had already traveled around the world. This is where we are as of, I think yesterday, on that United Kingdom variant, that it has been imported to the countries where, that are light purple. And there's documented human to human transmission of that variant where it is dark purple. And we know it's documented human to human transmission because people find that they are infected with this new variant, but have no history of traveling. So they could only have picked it up in their local community. So it is here and it is spreading and has been spreading for some time. The South African variant, which also has another name, B.1.351, its first known sequence containing this variant uh, from Cape Town was in early October. And so it first spread, it looks like, to Australia and the United Kingdom and travelers. And then by the end of December was in multiple other European countries as well. We have importation as well to North America and Asia with documented local transmission within the community in Southern Africa and also in the United Kingdom. Those two lineages and also a cluster of mutation that emerged in Denmark and Mark and the link in, in mink have multiple mutations with them, so eight or nine. And some of these are in common and some of them are different. 
And so when the viruses have mutations in common, that could either be that that confers some selective advantage so that it happened to pop up multiple times and stay, or because they're building on top of something that became globally dominant. That second possibility is true for the mutation I'm showing you in blue, D614G. That means that at position 614 in the sequence that spells out the spike protein, it used to encode D, that's a, the amino acid aspartic acid. And sometime in February, a mutation occurred which switched it to G, that's glycine. That conferred the ability of the virus to grow several fold more abundantly, and that helped it become globally dominant within a month. So all of these new variants are now building upon that first mutation. That first mutation, D614G, that's something that we published on in August showing how it first emerged in February and within a month had become essentially the virus that was spreading around the world. And it allows the virus to grow at a higher copy number. That could help with transmission. I don't see how it wouldn't help with transmission. And it's sort of like a corn plant that now grows three to nine ears instead of one, right? There's just a lot more corn. And that's why this has become globally dominant. Now, fortunately, that one mutation didn't seem to affect the ability of antibody to inactivate it. If anything, it was a little easier to neutralize. So we weren't as worried about it evading the immune response there. The worry was that it made the virus fitter. The other mutations have now emerged on top of that. One of particular concern that's in all of these variants is N501Y. That's at position 501 in the spike protein. It used to be asparagine, N, and is now tyrosine, Y. That mutation occurs exactly at the site where the spike protein in red interacts with a human receptor called A2. So this is the crystal structure, the X-ray crystal structure, looking at the molecular interactions of the surfaces by which virus sees human, anchors on and starts the infection process. A substitution or a change, a one letter change that changes that one little tiny piece of chemistry allows the red spike protein to anchor more tightly to the receptor. It helps infection. And that has been such an advantage for the virus that the same random mutation event has occurred and been selected and settled on and propagated multiple times independently. That same mutation emerged in research mice housed in an isolated box. It emerged in people in the United Kingdom. It emerged in different people in South Africa. A related mutation emerged in mink and also in humans in Denmark. So selection of that position gives an advantage to the virus. And it's such an advantage that that random event of the change at that site has happened and been selected multiple times in multiple places. The worry about this one is that it seems to make the virus more effective, more transmissible. The other worries are these two. By changing the surface chemistry on that red protein, we not only change its ability to bind receptor, binds receptor better, it might bind antibody worse. A lot of antibodies work by inactivating the virus. And one way in which they inactivate the virus is to anchor onto exactly that red thing in exactly that red place. By covering up the receptor binding site, those antibodies can prevent a virus from attaching to its ACE2 receptor and entering the cell. But many of those antibodies might need that original amino acid at position 501. And if we've gone and changed it, we've changed the chemistry of that surface and those antibodies might no longer bind. So by changing the virus, we might have now escaped some portion of the antibodies against that site. The second thing is this, that we've altered the kinetics. So it's always a race, a battle, um, between the ability of the virus to infect and the ability of the immune system to tamp it down. If we've conferred an advantage to the virus, it might outpace the immune system. And if we've conferred an advantage to the virus for its speed and strength by which it can attach to and enter your cells, we might have outcompeted the ability of the immune system to defend it. What we may certainly have done is by accelerating the virus, we might threaten the pace by which humans can deliver vaccines. So if we have accelerated the speed of the outbreak, if we've increased the number of people that get infected from any other 
infected person. If we've increased the likelihood that somebody will get sick upon being infected, that outbreak number of cases start to accelerate and it, it's, it's threatening the ability that by which we can deliver vaccines to deliver protection. So the important thing to know is that there are now multiple clusters of mutations that have emerged in this human to human transmission. We have many clusters that have emerged in many parts of the world. There are 20 documented clades of the virus. There are 12 that are co-circulating. The more successful ones tend to take over and the weaker ones tend to go extinct. There are new variants which have just been sequenced in Brazil and elsewhere, and I'm sure there are more that are currently circulating that just haven't been sequenced yet. And so the major question on all of our minds is, will antibodies still work? Will the antibodies elicited by your vaccine or elicited by your first protect, your infection protect you? And will the antibodies that we're delivering as intravenous therapeutics still work? And that is the key question that my lab has been focused on. Many of you asked about that, and many of you asked about the status of my antibody consortium. So the consortium that I'm running is this, the Coronavirus Immunotherapeutic Consortium is called COVID. The goal of COVID was to compare everybody's competing antibody therapeutics side by side, figure out which are best, what makes them best, and which ones we want to deliver as drugs. So antibody therapy is like anti-venom. When you get a snake bite, you go and get a shot of anti-venom, and that is an array of antibodies against the snake toxin. They immediately seek out, anchor onto, and inactivate that snake toxin before it can do its damage. That will prevent that snake toxin from amplifying the disease. And you know, with a snake bite, you want the antivenom right away. You don't wanna wait until your leg turns purple and then hope for the best. The same thing is true with antiviral antibody. If you get bitten by a rabid dog, you get antibody against rabies virus and you want it right away. You want that antibody to seek out and destroy the virus and alert your immune system to control it before that infection has taken hold. The same thing is true for antiviral antibody. If you don't already have antibody against the novel coronavirus because you haven't been infected, you haven't been vaccinated, or maybe you're immune compromised, you can get effective antibody, in fact, more effective antibody than you may have made yourself through intravenous drip. And the way we do this is we look at the immune response of survivors. And in the immune response of the survivor, there are um, billions and billions of potential antibodies against all sorts of different things. And we can search through and find the needles in the haystack, find just the one or two absolutely most potent ones that could rapidly inactivate coronavirus. You can scale them up and deliver them in a very precise way and essentially get the immune response of a rock star in a couple of hours instead of needing a month and a half to develop the immune response. It's slower and it's expensive, so it's not practical to deliver to millions of people, but it's a key life-saving therapeutic option. It also gives us a lot of information. By understanding how the very best antibodies work, we can look and see if vaccines are eliciting those kinds of antibodies or people that have survived an infection are eliciting those kinds of antibodies. So I've been tasked to figure out what the best antibodies are and how we can make them available to people that have become infected because they weren't vaccinated, weren't yet vaccinated, people that can't be vaccinated like pregnant women or people with some um, immunocompromised conditions or in people who were vaccinated, but the vaccine just didn't take. The goals of this program are to get all of the competing therapeutic products from 50 to 70 different companies and compare them side by side. Everyone will think their therapeutic is the best, but we wanna put them on a level playing field and make an apples to apples comparison, and do an independent analysis to figure out what's best and why, what makes them best. Make sure that we can find ones that are affordable enough that we can deliver them anywhere in the world. Because with a rapidly propagating respiratory virus, we aren't safe here unless people are safe everywhere in the world. There are places in the world where people can't social distance, they will starve to death. And if there is no immune protection in these regions, the virus will continue to boomerang and circulate around the planet. So that's a key goal. While we're at it, while we have gone to all the trouble of getting the competing companies to agree and, and get that resource of candidate therapeutics to compare side by side, we can actually build a lasting body of information of what constitutes effective immune control, effective therapeutic mechanisms against this virus. And we can look in this database of, of, of different antibody therapeutics and figure out which ones are going to be most durable, 
which ones are most resistant to those mutations, which ones are lost when mutations in a certain city have emerged, which ones we can still deliver. So we want to get that body of information. So right now we've been able to get 239 different uh, MABs, is monoclonal antibodies, 239 different competing antibody therapeutics, and the consortium is growing. They have been donated to us from people on four different continents, from everything from academic labs and nonprofits to the major multinational corporations that are household names. And the data that we're generating in my lab is being used by Operation Warp Speed and the foundations and the clinical trials to help understand which ones we should be investing in and analyzing. The workflow for that international effort is this, that all the antibodies come into my lab, they're all given a code name to make it very fair. Then we distribute these antibodies to multiple experts in the world that are each the best at figuring out one aspect of antibody function. They collect all that data, we put it back together into an immediately publicly available database in order to look in a multifactorial way about how these antibodies working and understand which ones are best. So in this database, we've been able to rank order these therapeutics by how well they anchor to that surface spike protein, how well they neutralize viral infection. And we've been also able to do this. This is what is important for understanding what will be resistant to those mutant varieties and what will remain durable. We've been able to sort all these antibodies by what footprint they have in the spike. So I'm showing you multiple molecular structures that we actually have. We have very powerful microscopes in my lab. They're 11 feet tall and they shine an electron beam down so that we can now see things that used to be submicroscopic and now come within view. And we can directly image that surface protein of the coronavirus spike. It's shown here in white, that's its molecular surface. And then the colored ribbon underneath, the red, blue, and green, that is the chain of the genetic information that's been translated into the folded up polypeptide code. It's been coiled up into that certain shape that has a certain surface chemistry. The antibodies that have anchored onto the spike are each one of these different rainbow colors. That's the business end of the antibody, the antigen binding fragment anchored on. You can see they all approach it in different ways and they hit a different footprint. And we can sort them into neighborhoods and clusters. That's the kind of rainbow map on the left to find out which ones anchor to different places. By understanding which ones anchor to different places, we can understand which ones are and are not susceptible to different mutations that have emerged. So what you see here is looking at each individual mutation that has emerged in this set we've looked at or that have emerged in combination. We can look and see which type of antibody is or is not still effective. If it's boxed in pink, we've lost that antibody or lost a lot of activity of that antibody. We need to deliver a lot more of a dose to still get it to work. If it's green, that antibody has actually improved its ability to neutralize in the presence of that mutation. So we can go through and we can find which therapeutics are still valid in certain regions and which therapeutics are resistant to those escape mutations. Those are the ones that we want to deliver going forward. And so these are some of the ones that look like they've gotten better, more effective, or haven't been hurt by the changes in the virus. Those are the ones we want to deliver. Many of you asked me if the vaccines will still work in the presence of these mutations that are emerging. And I think they will. The vaccine makers have evaluated the sera, the blood, the, the population of antibodies in the blood of people that have received those vaccines. And those antibodies can still inactivate the mutant viruses, or at least viruses bearing the key mutation that people were most concerned about, the 501Y. Testing is still in progress on the complete variant with all eight or nine substitutions. And the reason I think that the vaccines will mostly still work is this, that antibody-mediated immunity in what's called the polyclonal level, many clones, the whole array of different antibody responses that are in your blood after you've gotten a vaccine or after you have survived an infection, it's not a light switch. It's not on and off. There's thousands and thousands of different kinds of antibodies in there. And just like you saw in those molecular structures with all the rainbow coloring, every one of them hits a different spot. And so you might lose a couple with mutation, but you still have all the rest. And so antibody immunity, it's not an all on or all off light switch. It's more like a dimmer switch, or you might lose a little bit, but you still have the rest. You might dim 5%. And in fact, Vaccine-mediated immunity or natural immunity is more like 
not just one dimmer switch, but a whole panel of dimmer switches. Because in addition to antibody, immune response also has different kinds of T cells, different kinds of innate immune protection. And depending on how those different dimmer switches are correlated, you know, all of them on, that's a lot better than only some of them on. A couple of mutations will dim some of them a little bit, but you may still have enough light. We actually looked at that question. So we took 48 convalescent sera, that's blood from 48 people that lived in San Diego that got infected earlier this winter and then got better. Of those 48 convalescent patients, 40 of them had antibodies in their blood that could neutralize the virus. Eight of them did not have antibodies that could neutralize the virus. And we looked to see of those sera, which ones were still effective against individual mutations one at a time. And that's the green and purple. And you see there's really not much difference. They all cluster about the same. These sera seem to work just fine and if there's any one mutation. The worry with the clusters of mutations, eight or nine that have emerged in uh, the United Kingdom, South Africa and other variants, is that by having more and more mutations, you knock out more and more antibodies. And so when we put the first four together to build these clusters, we can see that we start to lose some of these sera. There's not much effect for any one mutation, but there is an effect when you get cumulative mutations. And about 20% of these sera lose maybe half their activity. So for many of them, there's not much difference. 80% of people's sera that started out neutralizing is still just fine, but there's a minority that are worse. And so over the scope of a pandemic and a vaccinated population, many of them will not see a difference. Some will see that dimmer switch turn a little bit. So others of you asked, should I get the vaccine if the virus is changing or should I wait for a different vaccine? And I think you should get whatever vaccine you can get as soon as you can get it. And the reason is this, with no vaccine, it is a light switch, it is off. You have no immunity, you are fresh meat to that virus. With a vaccine, you do have an immune response on board. If the vaccine is a perfect match for the virus that you might get infected with, the sequence hasn't changed, it's 100% dimmer on all the way. If a few mutations have populated, you've just turned that dimmer switch a little bit, but you still have everything else. You still might have 90, 95% of the light, and that might, that's gonna be enough to keep you safe. So get whatever vaccine you can get as soon as you can get it. Can they adapt the vaccines? Yes, they can. And so one of the chief advantages of this new mRNA vaccine is that the physical material that's the part of the vaccine, the, just the messenger RNA, is easier to manufacture and easier to change right away. And so they could make a different sequence in maybe six weeks. And the question is how much testing do we, they, they can't just automatically inject a new thing. It does have to go through some testing, but it may be able to be tested more rapidly or not need so many tens of thousands of people. And so that could be changed. And so if we have coronavirus for a long time, we might think about having a seasonal coronavirus vaccine that's matching whatever that year's virus might be. Now, many of you asked other things about the vaccine. So if I have allergies, should I worry about getting the vaccine? The allergic events to the vaccine are exceptionally rare. It's, I think, 0.007% of people, but it's not zero. So if you are a person prone to anaphylaxis, so if you have an anaphylactic reaction to uh, you know, nuts or shellfish or something like that, you will want to have somebody watch you uh, after you get that vaccine. And in most of the vaccination centers and doctor's office, you do have to park and they watch you for 15 minutes to make sure that there isn't a reaction. If you have an EpiPen, bring it. For the vast majority of people, 99.9%, .9%, there's no, um, no adverse reaction. Many of you asked about the side effects of the vaccine. And the way to think about it is that the side effects are really the effects. The job of a vaccine is to mount an immune response. You want your immune system to see this thing as foreign so that it mounts a response. The advantage of vaccine is that you're showing the shape and surface chemistry of the foreign thing in a way that won't infect you and won't cause disease. But when your immune system is building its immune response to protect you, you will get things like a sore arm and a headache and maybe a light fever. Those are 
hallmarks that you are experiencing an immune reaction and you want that. You want an immune reaction to your vaccine. You want it to develop an immune response. If you don't have the immune response, you don't have the immune protection. So it's common with this and all shots. Your arm might hurt a while, you might have a headache, you might be a little tired. That's your immune system working to give you that protection on board. Many of you asked about um, adaption of vaccines and the durability of the vaccines. Will this vaccine still protect me all year? You know, we've only known about this virus for one year. And so our duration of protection information is only one year. For other related coronaviruses, it's quite individual. There are some people that still have antibodies to that SARS-1 infection that they got 20 years ago. There are other people for whom that response waned. There's often different ways you can measure the antibody response. If you look in circulating blood, that's circulating antibody. But you have another pool, that's your memory response. The memory response won't register just in the circulating sera, but it's there. And so you don't want to have high levels of circulating antibodies to every possible pathogen that once you've ever been exposed or ever been vaccinated. What you do is you have one circulating for which you've been recently infected and a smaller level of the other ones. Your memory response will rapidly amplify by remembering this immune response to some other pathogen as soon as you are exposed or re-exposed to it. So even if the antibody seems to have waned or diminished a little bit in sera, circulating antibody, you may still have that immune response. I expect that the multi-clone, multi-antibody response will be durable. If enough mutations seem to propagate and continue to accumulate over the year, the vaccine makers will probably adapt their vaccines in order to make a better match. And they do that every year for flu. Now, others of you asked, if you have been infected before, can you be reinfected with coronavirus? How often does that happen? And the related question, if you've been infected and gotten better, could you still spread it to someone else if you're not sick yourself? And those are really good questions. On the subject of reinfection, a new study just came out where they looked at 6,600 healthcare workers in the United Kingdom. And of those 6,600, which they followed over five months, these are 6,600 people that got infected, got better. They followed them for five months, 44 got reinfected. So that's 0.7% of them. So 99.3% did not get reinfected, but some did. And so it happens. It's something that we need to know about because you cannot assume that you are fully protected always and you might spread it, but it is more of the exception than the rule. And there's two different things here. There's, does the vaccine protect you from disease? And does the vaccine protect you from infection? And those are different. Disease is when you're really sick and your life is threatened, or you have enough symptoms that you're coughing and spreading more virus into the air. Infection, well, we know you can be asymptomatic and have a lot of virus replicating and have no idea and you can still share it. And the way that it, a viral infection works, let's say you've been vaccinated against polio or measles and a couple years later you come across polio or measles, that virus might still infect one or a couple of cells, but your rapidly amplifying memory immune response will take care of it. So you will be technically infected, but it's just a couple of cells. You're not contagious. And so if you ask the precise question, if you've been infected before, can you get infected again? Yes, if you come in contact with coronavirus, you probably will get infected again. One or a couple of cells will probably get infected, but your immune response should clear it. Some people, that original immune response was insufficient and they got sick again. For other people, the question is, we don't know the extent to which everybody's individual immune response keeps control of the virus. And so we don't know always whether or not someone is controlling that virus enough to prevent spreading it to others. And while most of the population is still unvaccinated or what we call immunologically naive, they're still susceptible, we want to be careful to make sure that we aren't amplifying that outbreak. Others of you asked, which vaccine should I get? Should I get the Moderna, should I get the Pfizer? Which one of those is better for older people? Do they work well in all races? The really practical answer is that you probably won't get a choice. We are so limited in the numbers of vaccines that we have that your choice may be take it or leave it, not Moderna versus Pfizer. You might just get the only one that's available. The Pfizer 
BioNTech vaccine. Their data suggests that it's about 95% effective. The Moderna, the data is 94% effective, so very similar. The Pfizer vaccine delivers a 30 microgram dose, two shots, 21 days apart. The Moderna vaccine gives you a 100 microgram dose, two shots, 28 days apart. Some of their original data looked like the efficacy was just a touch lower in older people for the Moderna vaccine, but it was a very small statistical sample. So it's hard to know if that's real or that's just the noise. I think they're very similar and I think either one would be fine. The data in the clinical trial suggests that they work equally well in all races. The challenge is that both of these need what's called a, a cold chain. They have to be kept in a freezer, in a really a deep freezer, negative 80 Celsius. It's colder than our kitchen freezers. And maintaining that cold temperature is kind of a challenge. You know, they're perishable, they expire, especially going to be hard to try to deliver them extensively around the world and in um, developing nations. And also through a lot of parts of this country, it's hard to find minus 80 freezers. What I do know, I can't really answer which vaccine you should get. You should just get the one that's available. But I can say what vaccine you should not get. And I would say the one you don't want is the inactivated virus vaccine. So a lot of you asked about that. That's the Chinese and Russian inactivated virus vaccines. I don't think those are as good. In fact, the data suggests that they're not. And the reason is the process that happens in inactivation, what it actually does. And those are shape changes in that surface spike. So this is the surface protein of the virus that it uses to anchor to the ACE2. This is the one to which your antibodies um, bind. The antibodies recognize a particular shape in chemistry. If you have the wrong shape, the antibodies don't bind, the antibodies don't work. That spike protein on the surface of the virus is a spring-loaded mechanism. It starts in one more compact shape, and then it springs forward as it infects the cells. And we call those before membrane fusion and after membrane fusion, before and after. And it's very much like this, where it's a spring-loaded thing that irreversibly drives forward to infect your cells. The job of antibody, is to lock that mechanism together, much like the club on your car, that the binding of that antibody to anchoring onto the mechanism would prevent that springing of spike. The trouble with the inactivation process is it goes ahead and springs all those spikes. And so what's shown to your immune system, so the before, the compact one is light blue, and the after, the sprung one is an orange, and they're different shapes, and they have different surfaces and different chemistries. If you vaccinate with something that's mostly the wrong shape, you will elicit mostly the wrong antibodies. And that's actually been shown by direct imaging of the process of those spikes. So the inactivation process doesn't give you the right kinds of antibodies. And there are classic vaccine studies of challenges with early development of vaccines, for example, respiratory syncytial virus, which causes respiratory disease in newborns and can be life-threatening for preemies, where the inactivation process put all the wrong shape on the surface of the virus so you lost the kind of antibodies you'd want to have. And it is true for this kind of protein, the spike protein of coronavirus and all other viruses like this, the stability of that jack-in-the-box is a problem. And so how do the mRNA vaccines get around it? Well, they do one thing. They don't make the protein itself that would spring. Instead, they just take the one gene that encodes it. They package that one gene in lipids, like a tiny microscopic oil droplet, those lipids will enter some of your professional immune cells whose job is to then make that red protein and show it to their immune system to make that response. It's very safe. It's what they were designed to do. There's no virus there. It's just the piece so that you have an immune response ready to go against that key piece. So your spikes are more likely to be in the right shape because they haven't been inactivated through any external chemical process or heat. But it's still a challenge to get your own cells to make them the right way. And there's a couple of tricks that have been used to try to get it to do that. The very first idea, and that's what's in the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, is something called 2P. It's introducing two proline residues. Those proline amino acids introduce little kinks that help anchor the protein in the right shape. The second generation idea is something stronger than that, which is just a staple, just a molecular staple. It's a disulfide bond. They've introduced a staple into the top of the spike to hold it in the right shape. And we have now improved upon that idea even further 
by moving the staple and making other changes so that it is rock solid in the right shape better presents the right structure, especially the parts that don't change, and better displays the right sugars that coat the virus that your immune system needs to understand how to evade. So that's the third generation vaccine candidate that my lab is working on. And the really exciting thing about it is that it's stable at room temperature. It's not susceptible to the cold chain problems that others are. We can also use that molecule as a tool to discover better antibodies. And so the challenge with the mutation variants and the challenge with coming up with seasonal return of this virus and the challenge with having vaccines and therapeutics that respond to the changing virus is that it's changing. Most of the current therapeutics target that top, the part where it anchors to the cell. And that's the part of the virus that changes its sequence the most. The bottom, this is the machinery, this is the jack-in-the-box machinery, doesn't change. It's critical for the virus to not have errors there. If you have antibodies that anchor onto that machinery, they're going to be less susceptible to mutagenic escape. But how do we find them? So my lab has a particular tool and a particular strategy for this. We are protein engineers. We have engineered that copy of Spike to hold the better shape and show the better surface chemistry. And we can use this for precise molecular recognition experiments. So we have this machine called the beacon. And inside the beacon, there's something the size of a postage stamp, which is a microfluidic cell. And we can use light to separate individual B cells. Those are the cells that make each one single antibody and separate them into individual little holding pens. And then we can interrogate those cells and ask each individual cell if they make a certain kind of antibody that we want. Do they make an antibody that's resistant to mutation? Do they make an antibody that will prevent other coronavirus diseases and other coronavirus infections as well? And we can use light as a signal beacon, let's forget this name, the beacon, to light up the position of the one cell we want that makes the one antibody sequence that we want. And then we can use light again to decide which is the one antibody that we want to study, lift it out, analyze it, and make more of it as a therapeutic. We've done a proof of concept on a similar virus that has a similar springing mechanism, and we can take preparations of that surface spike that are the shapes we do want and don't want and look at all the different antibodies and say, here's one, the antibody binds right thing and wrong thing. We have this antibody, this is one we do want. It's the one that holds the molecule in the right shape, prevents that jack in the box spreading. And we have other antibodies that only recognize things that we don't want, it's the wrong shape. So we're using that kind of technology to now sort for ideal coronavirus antibodies that will fit into and improve upon those that are already in that global consortium of therapeutics. So what I've shown you today is we're leading a global effort to figure out what antibody therapeutics work best and why. We're looking at 240 of them that come from four continents. We're sorting them out by where they bind, how well they work, which are and are no longer susceptible or no longer um, effective against emerging mutations. And we're engineering portions of Spike as a better vaccine and a better tool. These are the folks on my research team. And I really want to thank them for all of their effort, um, days, nights, and weekends against this pandemic, particularly Dr. Sharon Chandel, my program manager for the COVID consortium. Kate Hasey leading up the antibody discovery effort, Eduardo Omadias, Colin Mann, Hao Yang Li, and Damsey Rai for all bringing so much spike engineering, and all the different labs and contributors in the COVID consortium. And I will stop sharing, and I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have in the time that remains. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Sapphire. My goodness, a lot of really good information. And it's amazing how far we've come. I mean, we've had this, this is our second webinar together, which we so appreciate. And, we weren't close to vaccines back then. So, you know, we definitely have entered a new chapter. So we've got a lot of questions that have come in. So I'd love to, to start if I could with you. Mm -hmm. So the, the first is people are very curious, have you been vaccinated? And if so, did you have a choice? And if so, uh, what did you choose and why? Not yet. I have an appointment as an essential worker and I'll just get whatever is on offer at Pitco. I don't know what it's gonna be. I think Moderna. I went for the take it and uh, the take it and leave it options. <laughs> exactly, exactly you described. That's right. Okay. Uh, next question. So, is the type of mutation you are describing with COVID nineteen typical of any virus, or more worrisome than the typical viruses we seem to handle? 
It's common, all viruses mutate. They all make errors when they propagate. Now the rate of coronavirus is slower. Its rate of mutation is about half that of flu, 25% of that of HIV. That has some capacity to fix its own errors. But with 93 million infections, it's just propagating. All viruses do this. All viruses drift in their sequence and evade immune responses. Thank you. Okay, so a question, a couple questions around this topic. What danger are children facing without the benefit of vaccines as they interact with other children in schools, camps, summer activities, friends, et cetera? Yeah, so we don't have approval yet of a vaccine for children. Um, Nearly all children experience much more mild disease than adults. And so adults were the, especially elderly adults were the highest priority to vaccinate. But children certainly can get it and get infected. And there are some that are immunocompromised and it's more dangerous for them than others. It is more rare for a child to spread it to an adult than an adult to spread it to an adult. But um, we do wanna protect our kids and we send our kids to school with a couple hundred other kids and we want them to see their friends. And so that's something we need to uh, definitely move toward. Is their life as threatened as an older adult? Mostly not, but some are um, immunocompromised and some are cancer patients. And sometimes you don't know yet that your child has a disorder. Thank you. So uh, two questions that are kind of interrelated here. So if vaccinated individuals can still spread even though they've had the vaccine, should we be getting tested to see if we are asymptomatic spreaders? And kind of related, is there any chance you can spread the virus to someone even though you've had a vaccine? If you're vaccinated, you're much less likely to spread the virus than someone who has not been vaccinated, but it's not impossible. And so for a lot of us, for example, for me to be able to go to work, I must be tested frequently to make sure that I'm not an asymptomatic spreader. And so those of us that are, going to work that are essential workers will still be tested to see if we are or are not asymptomatic spreaders. And so I think if you, even if you have been vaccinated, if you're going to work, if you're interacting with other people, even masked, especially if you're seeing elderly people, you will want to make sure that you aren't inadvertently spreading the virus. You're much less likely to, but it's not a zero probability. That's great, great to know that. So next question. So is there value in convalesc convalescent serum for people who had an asymptomatic COVID infection? Convalescent serum is the first thing you have before you have discovered more potent antibodies. It is usually less effective than a monoclonal antibody therapy. It may be more available, particularly in developing nations where they don't have the access to these more precise therapies. So it could help. If someone is asymptomatic though, they are less likely to be a candidate for treatment than someone who is getting ill. So one could use convalescent serum to treat the asymptomatic, but of course it's limited in supply, right? There's only so many convalescents and they only have so much blood to give. Um, so it's possible, but it's probably not the highest priority treatment to be delivered. Makes sense. So two additional questions, somewhat again interrelated. So what, there are some longer term impacts of having COVID that are being talked about, you know, cognitive and other related issues. What are your thoughts around that? And how does that connect to vaccines? And then this, and then a related question is, do you have any sense of what the long-term health risks, risks are of the vaccine, say five to 10 years from now? It's the long-term effects that are really the concern, aren't they? Um, the 40 year olds that are throwing clots or the 40 year olds that um, become long haulers for one reason or another and they're foggy headed and um, have long term complications. That's why we need to be so careful. It's not merely just surviving. It, you wanna make sure that you haven't compromised your health and ability to work and care for your family in the long term. Um, what was the second part of the question? It was, how do the vaccines impact either managing those longer term impacts, those longer term, the, the long haulers, and also as the vaccines themselves, what are any delayed impacts five to 10 years from now of having taken the vaccine? Right. 
if you've gotten the vaccine, you are vastly less likely to get infected and then your chances of becoming one of those long haulers is a lot lower, right? I mean, don't prevent infection, prevent disease. You're less likely to have the virus establish itself as a chronic infection. Uh, five to 10 years out, I would expect that uh, you will still have some immunity against SARS-CoV-2 from these vaccines. Um, I'm not expecting any long-term consequences. Instead, I would expect a long-term benefit. I don't think we're done with coronaviruses. I think there's very likely to be a third one. This one is likely to have seasonal return. There's just so much of it on the planet right now. It's not gonna go away. Not anytime soon, yep. Uh, so this is actually to your comment you just made, it's somewhat similar. Will the methods used from this, the COVID vaccine, obviously we've, we've come up with a vaccine so quickly. I mean, historically it's incredible how that's come out. Uh, do you think some of the new science from that will help improve flu and other vaccines in the future? I think it will. So this is the first time we've really launched a vaccine made from mRNA in a large scale. Our flu vaccines are often amplified in chicken eggs, okay? And that's not ideal because it takes a long time to make the thing in chicken eggs. Some people are allergic to chicken eggs. Sometimes mutations occur in the egg itself that make the vaccine less efficacious than vaccines that are made other ways. So we can definitely stand to modernize many of our vaccine development methods. So the mRNA is good because you can do it really fast, right? This, these vaccines have come out in a year. The fastest we've ever made vaccines before was four years for months. Typically it's 10 years. We can make something quickly. We can respond to the next pandemic or we can more quickly change. You know, flu vaccine protection is correlated to how well that vaccine matches the type of flu virus that will spread. And the years when it's poor match, you get poor protection, more illness, more death. Good match, good protection. So if we had vaccine platforms that you could turn around more quickly, you would have a better idea what the emerging viruses were gonna be and have time to make the vaccine or change the vaccine. And so it's a really good idea for that purpose. What we now need to see is how long are they gonna last? Are they gonna last, give us lifelong immunity like our MMR vaccines, measles, mumps, rubella, or is it gonna be more transient where we have to get vaccines every year? And we just, you know, you need five years to see what the five-year effect is going to be. Thank you. Okay, another question, if we could. So if you have an immune deficiency, is it safe to get the vaccine? And you somewhat talked about this, but maybe you can expand on that. What about those going through immunotherapy treatment? Mm. So the reason why many immunodeficient people cannot get some vaccines is that some vaccines are made not from one harmless piece of the virus, but instead from an, a weakened virus or an attenuated virus. That virus is, is in some vaccines, not these, but other vaccines for other viruses intended to be weakened enough that it will infect your cells and propagate for a couple of cells, but it's something your immune system will rapidly be able to control. There are benefits about that. It looks like more of a threat to your immune system, so you might mount a stronger response. But what's weak in you and me isn't weak in an immunocompromised person. So they may, that virus could actually be a threat for them. So that's why they can't receive those kinds of vaccines. Can an immunocompromised person get an mRNA vaccine? I think the best thing to do is to talk to your doctor that best understands exactly what your particular condition would be. Um, this kind of vaccine doesn't present the threat that a weakened or attenuated replicating virus vaccine would, like the adenovirus vaccine. Um, and so it might be that it's more appropriate, but um, you'll have to talk to your doctor about what your particular condition might be. And if you're on immune therapy for something else, again, uh, just talk to your doctor about what the different um, things you should consider are. Definitely, if you are immunocompromised in any way, you are more susceptible to COVID-19 illness than other adults. So you are more in need of immune protection than other people. Thank you. So one of the comments you mentioned or educated us on earlier was the, as the mutations occur, it's possible that vaccines will be released to deal with those, those new mutations. Do you envision that those vaccines will have to stack on each other? Or will you have to have, you can take the brand new one that's been just released because of the mutations, or do you, how will that sequence work, do you envision? 
I don't know. I think they need to work out how much testing they're going to need and how long that will take. You could picture a scenario where the coronavirus vaccine is tuned every year to what the expected emerging sequences are. Or maybe instead of containing just one viral sequence, maybe it'll contain three. Like your flu vaccine often has three different kinds of flu in it. And so if they could anticipate what might emerge and come your way, they could dial that in every year. Um, but there's lots of things that we need to understand. Like how much testing do we need every time we make a variation? How long does this immunity last? Is it lifelong? The people that have gotten that first sequence, which is the original Wuhan sequence with the two prolines, are we still protected next year with all the drift from the accumulated mutations? If they're still protected, then changes may not be needed. If they're not protected, then that would inspire the need to develop new kinds of vaccines or complementary kinds of vaccines. Great. There are studies for other viruses where people got a stronger, more robust immune response by having different kinds of vaccines. So if they prime with one type and boost with another, they got a better response than two of the same. We don't have that data for coronavirus yet, but we have that data for Ebola, HIV, some other viruses. Other viruses, okay. Well, this will be probably our last question. And uh, a lot of people are really excited about the antibody consortium and the work that you're doing there. And so what else do you need right now to advance that important research? Mm -hmm. Perspective of, of what's, what does that chapter look like next for that work? We need to support the salaries of the postdocs and technicians that are actually doing this work. Um, the more mutations we can study, the better that body of information is. If we have that information in the database about this, you know, this therapy will or will not work in San Diego, we can better deliver the right thing. And then um, I need a piece of automation to add to my microscope that's going to let it run overnight for us. We don't need a hands-on and a more slower throughput process. Uh, definitely the pace of the research and the need for research is a lot faster than our ability to get your timing for the government grant process. That's great. Makes sense. Well, Dr. Sapphire, thank you so much for the time you took today. This is the second webinar we've had together and we learned so much. And we're obviously now entering this different chapter in the coronavirus story. And so getting that education is tremendous. Thank you as well to you and your team, all the incredible work you're doing. We wanna thank our guests. It was wonderful to have you all join. We hope that you found this helpful. Many of you submitted fantastic questions. We hope we got a lot of them answered in this session. And thanks again, Dr. Safa, for the time you spent with us. For those that we did not get to answer your question, we do commit to follow up with you and get them answered um, in a combination with the La Jolla Institute and our team. So we'll make sure to follow up with you directly. To all our clients and professional partners, we deeply value our relationships with you. Thanks for joining. We hope you found this as educational. And just so you know, we will have a, a recording of this webinar available in about a week on our website, which we'll distribute out. Thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, stay healthy and be well. Take care. <laughs>